Welcome to the e-learning course on negotiation of comprehensive economic partnership agreements, or CPAS. My name is Henry Gao. I'm a professor at Singapore Management University. For the next few days, I will walk you through the presentations on the negotiation of CPAS. Start with the introduction to CPAS to be followed by presentations on SPS TBT issues, investment provisions, service provisions, and e-commerce provisions. For the presentation today, the first one, we will start with an introduction to CPAS. CPAS, as some of you might know, is strictly speaking a type of regional trade agreements. So we will start with an overview of regional trade agreements in the multilateral trading system as represented by the World Trade Organization, or the WTO. And then we will discuss the economic rationale and the legal rules on RTAs. And then uh, last but certainly not least, we will discuss the rise of uh, CEPAS in recent years. So let's first of all start with the status of an RTA in the WTO. So uh, if you have engaged in trade negotiations at the WTO level, you will know that uh, the WTO negotiations are built on two principles. The first principle is that um, uh, it must be reciprocal. So this means that when you enter into WTO negotiations, you must offer something if you want something from the other party. So this is the first principle, the principle of a reciprocity. And the second principle is the principle of uh, most favored nation treatment, or MFN, which means that if you decide, let's see, to lower your tariff from 20% to 10%, then you have to offer the lower tariff of 10% to all other WTO members, rather than just one WTO member. But there are certain exceptions to both of these WTO rules, of reciprocity and of MFN. And depending on the different combination, we have different types of arrangements within the WTO. So if you look at the WTO arrangements, the first one is where you have a reciprocal concessions uh, plus uh, a selective membership that is a small number of WTO members would join this agreement. So this is what we would call an RTA, a regional trade agreements. The examples would be the EU, NAFTA, MOXO, and various uh, uh, EPAs. On the other hand, if the concessions are offered on a unilateral basis rather than on a reciprocal basis, and the members are only selective in the sense that only a select category of WTO members can enjoy the benefits, then this is what uh, is known as some sort of uh, uh, pre preferential uh, agreements. Uh, we, uh, in the WTO, we have the examples of uh, the continental agreement, uh, which is what the EU uh, provides to African countries, uh, and also the AGOA, which is what the US uh, provides to the African countries. Its full name is African Growth Opportunity Act. So this is uh, also uh, another type of uh, preferential agreement, but this is not the RTA that we will discuss today. And similarly, if you have uh, unilateral concessions that is uh, offered to all development country members of the WTO on a generalized basis, this is known as the GSP or the Generalized System of Preference. And again, the GSP is also not RTA. So remember when we talk about RTA, we are talking about reciprocal agreements that uh, are offered to only a select category of WTO members. That is what we mean by RTA. So uh, in the uh, WTO and beyond, if you look at the different categories of RTAs, you can see that there are several different types of RTAs. So at the bottom, you have a free trade area or an FTA or a partial scope FTA. So what is a free trade area? So let me give you an example here. 
Let's say that there are two countries, country A and B. They decided to sign a, a free trade agreement or an RTA. Uh, so uh, in such agreement, the tariffs would be eliminated on most goods, but each party still get to maintain its own MFN tariff structure. And they also put in place rules of origin uh, uh, regime in order to make sure that only the uh, products which truly originates from its FTA partner would be able to enjoy the benefit of the FTA. So in this example, let's say that before the formation of the FTA, country A for all products has a uniform MFN tariff rate of 6%, while country B has variable tariff rate based on the product and they range from 0% to 30%. So after the FDA came into being, you do not need to pay any tariff if you are export, uh, if you are exporter based in A wanting to export to B and vice versa. But as I said, this is reciprocal, this is bilateral, so it only applies to the bilateral trade between A and B, and it does not apply to the trade from other WTO members to A or to B. So. Um, as you can see here, the common features of FTAs are that they have a comprehensive trade liberalization. Typically, the WTO requirement is that you have to realize you have to liberalize uh, uh, the uh, the uh, trade restrictions on substantially all the trade, which we will discuss in a moment as to what it means, and it applies on reciprocal basis, uh, and sometimes. Uh, there is um, uh, the uh, adoption of a so-called negative list approach where, uh, let's say, uh, you only uh, apply tariffs on some of the products which are not included in the tariff exemptions uh, or reductions. And uh, sometimes some of these FTAs also include concessions beyond just the tariff concession. So this is FTA. Now, um, if... A and B, after having FTA for a while, they might want to uh, uh, go one step further by entering into a, a higher form of uh, RTA that is known as customer's union. So what is a customer's union? For a customer's union, as I said earlier, it is one step ahead of the FTA. So in this case, in addition to eliminating tariffs in the bilateral trade on uh, uh, the two countries, they also agree to adopt a common external tariff regime. So in this case, country A and B, in addition to remove the tariffs on the trade uh, between themselves, also agree to uh, uh, impose a common external tariff, let's say, of uh, between 5 to 10 percent, depending on the product. And this would lead to the formation of a customer's union. So in a customer's union, uh, there would be a compensation paid to some countries if the bond tariffs are raised as a result of forming the customer's union. And another uh, interesting about customer's union is that, as you can see here, so previously, country A and B each have their customer's regime. So if you are exporter, you want to export to country A, you have to go through the port of country A. And if you want to uh, export to country B, you would go through the port of country B. Because otherwise, if you, uh, let's say, want to export to country A and you enter through country B first, when you export from country B to country A, you have to pay the tariff one more time. But this problem would no longer exist if you have a customer's union between A and B because now they have a common external tariff. So for exporters to A and B, it doesn't matter where they export to first. So long as they enter into the customer union, then the goods will be able to be re-exported uh, uh, to other parts of the customer's union uh, uh, tariff free. So this provides an incentive for the exporters to find the port that is the cheapest, that is the closest to export to. So let's say that B has a very good port. So uh, all exporters decided from now on, even if we want to export to A, we will just uh, uh, export to the port in country B. 
and then ship it, uh, and then uh, somehow transport it, uh, let's say, uh, by truck from country B to country A. Now, in such a case, the customer's revenue would be collected by the customer's authorities in country B alone, and the customer's authorities in country A would receive very little or no customer's revenue. So, such a case is uh, 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 very bad for country A because they lose a lot of customers' revenue. So, uh, typically for customers' unions, they have to design a scheme to share the customers' revenue in order to prevent this from happening. And also uh, to prevent the other countries from abusing the system and uh, uh, try to pass up their products as originating from within the customers' union, we also need a rules of origin regime in order to make sure that uh, the products from the other countries will be treated as such rather than passing off as products uh, originating from within the customers' union and therefore enjoy the benefits of the customers' union, which was initially intended for uh, the members of the customers' union, that is, the producers based in A and B. And the last type of RTA uh, would be uh, a common market, uh, the one uh, like uh, uh, in the uh, in the uh, in the EU, uh, and also a economic uh, uh, union. Uh, the EU is also an economic union. So uh, if you uh, look at uh, the degree uh, of uh, economic integration, as you can see. From the bottom to top, the degree increases. If you look at the coverage of economic activity, uh, um, again, uh, the coverage also expands from the bottom to uh, the uh, uh, top of this chart here. So these are the different types of RTAs. So um, in recent years, if you look at the data, uh, we can see that uh, there are many RTAs uh, around the world uh, that is becoming more and more common according to WTO data. So why do we have this uh, proliferation of regional trade agreements? Now, there are a lot of reasons, and uh, uh, here we will discuss mainly the economic reason and the political reasons. For the economic reasons, uh, first of all, these countries want to gain additional uh, market access because, as I mentioned earlier, RTAs reduce or even remove tariff and therefore they expand the market access for the members of the RTAs. And RTAs can also uh, uh, help to uh, build deeper integration of the markets of the members of the RTA by merging their markets together because by removing the tariff and the customers' uh, requirements, they are basically becoming uh, one single market which is uh, uh, a good news for the producers based in the RTs because now they have a, a bigger market to sell to. Uh, and sometimes uh, RTs could also uh, be due to the so-called defensive necessity. Uh, this is related to the so-called domino effect of RTs. So basically, when one country entered an RTA with another country, its competitor in the region might decide to also enter into RTA with uh, uh, its partner country simply so that it will not be losing out in the competition. So this is what we would call um, basically a defensive type of RTA or domino effect. That is uh, once one chip uh, falls down, the other chips also start falling down because they do not want to lose out in this competition. And another reason for the RTAs is to lock out a competition and to lock in investment. So if you form an RTA with other country uh, with, uh, uh, to, to have a bigger market, this will make uh, your market to be more attractive to the foreign investors and they would want to come in. And vice versa, uh, this would mean that uh, your competitor's market now become less attractive because you now have a larger market and uh, this would mean that um, uh, your competitors uh, would be disadvantaged by the formation of the RTAs. 
There are also political reasons. So if you look at many of the RTs that are currently in place, you could argue that actually many of the RTs do not make much economic sense. Uh, instead, they make a lot of political sense. For example, the U.S. RTA, the U.S. FTA with Jordan. How much trade is there between U.S. and Jordan? The answer is not much, but the U.S. still want to enter into an RTA with Jordan. Why? Because Jordan is regarded by the U.S. as key ally in the Middle East, and therefore they want to use the FTA to reward their uh, 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 faithful ally in the region. So uh, if you look at um, uh, the political reasons uh, uh, to enhance the security among the members, that is one very important reason, and also, as I mentioned earlier, to ensure or reward political support is also another important reason. Uh, and another reason uh, uh, for a country's intent to RTAs is to increase the bargaining power in the multilateral forum by basically by uh, merging your market with another market, uh, then you would be able to gain uh, a much bigger say in the multilateral process. And the case, uh, a case in point for this could be the ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, which by entering into an RTA now uh, can have a much bigger economic cloud on a collective basis in the multilateral forum. And also another reason for internal RTA is mainly a domestic political reason. So uh, as we know, in every country, there are trade liberalizing forces. That is the uh, sectors which are competitive and which want the country to um, uh, basically further liberalize their trade so that they can take advantage of opportunities abroad. And then there are trade protection support force. So basically the sectors which are less competitive and which want more protection. So um, the balance between these two different uh, camps would, uh, uh, would decide the uh, trade policies of such a country. So sometimes in order to encourage political reform, uh, the countries would enter into RTs so that the uh, trade liberal, uh, liberalizing camp would be further strengthened because they get more benefit from the RTA so that they can push for economic reforms uh, more easily. And if you look at uh, the reasons for developed and development countries, uh, they would have uh, different reasons for entering into RTAs. For developed countries, uh, so if you look at the U.S., the U.S. basically has to step up the uh, uh, negotiation of RTAs uh, after around 2008 when the Doha round started to run into a problem. Uh, why? Because the U.S. realized that with the WTO running into a problem uh, uh, and if they want trade liberalization, they can only do it at the bilateral level by using their asymmetric uh, trade call uh, political power at the bilateral level. And also, um, as we uh, have seen, the RTs can also use to support foreign policy goals, including development. So this is not only the case for RTs, but also the case for various uh, preference regimes like the AGOA for the U.S., which encourage development in Africa, but also RTA is also a very useful tool. And uh, the RTs also provide economic benefits in the sense that uh, they enhance or expand the access to markets in areas other uh, than goods trade, for example, services, intellectual property, and investment, all of which are key areas of interest for countries like the U.S., but because they could not get this at the multilateral level, so that is why they want to push it at the uh, bilateral level or the regional level. And this really helped them to push through a WTO plus or WTO X agenda, which we, we will discuss later, uh, uh, which means that uh, uh, the, all these new issues they can bring in uh, through the uh, regional treaty agreements. For development countries, uh, they uh, have different reasons for entering the RTs. First of all, these RTs provide more secure access to developed markets than unilateral programs 
like the GSP regimes or AGUA or the Cantonal Agreement. Why? Because for the unilateral programs, because they are unilateral, therefore the terms are often dictated by the preference granting country. So they would have all kinds of conditions for developed countries to satisfy and the developed countries might discover that these conditions are too onerous for them to uh, fulfill. So uh, instead, RT provide another opportunity for getting access to the markets of the US or EU because by entering to RTAs, which are bilateral, you now have also a say in the process. And you can uh, uh, basically uh, make sure that uh, the concessions would apply on bilateral basis rather than just on unilateral basis. So it will not be subject to the whim or the political environment of the preference granting country. And another reason for developed countries to enter into RTEs is to attract foreign investment and technology transfer. Basically, by uh, opening up for RTAs, foreign investors would uh, um, be welcome and they would come in and they would bring in uh, the capital and they would also bring in the much needed technology. And sometimes RTAs are also used to facilitate trade among neighboring countries. And this is the case of the truly regional RTAs like the ASEAN or the uh, Mercosur Agreement and so on. Uh, and last but not least, the RTAs also provide a useful framework for regional cooperation. So uh, as we say here, the cooperations take place not only uh, at the economic level, but also at the political uh, and a security level. And ASEAN, again, is a good example. ASEAN started as a kind of a political or security organization, and it continues uh, to push for uh, economic uh, integration. But of course, uh, the RTAs, uh, even though they bring in many benefits, they also come with the cost. So let's look at the cost and benefits. For the benefits, first of all, as I mentioned earlier, RTAs uh, lead to the formation of bigger markets, and with bigger markets comes with much larger economies of scale, and uh, this made sure that uh, the uh, the RTAs, uh, the members, can have access to bigger markets. Uh, and previously, let's say that they just manufacture for their own domestic market, and now they have their own domestic market, plus the domestic markets are the RTA partners, which uh, makes it more uh, efficient and uh, um, uh, better in producing. And also, uh, there's uh, increased competition and efficiency in domestic producers um, uh, in the sense that uh, they now have to face more competition from other uh, RT uh, partners. And this could also lead to improved terms of trade and attracting foreign investment and technology transfer, as I mentioned earlier. And this could lead to the so-called uh, the trade creation effect. Um, but on the other hand, the cost would include the loss of the tariff revenue, which they could collect before. Uh, the uh, additional administrative resources they need to negotiate an administer an RTA, and also uh, they might need to uh, comply with the complex and different regulatory regimes in case of a multiple RTA membership. If a country is a member of several RTAs, they could have different, let's say, TBT, SPS rules, different rules of origin, which made it difficult for the firms to satisfy these uh, requirements. And sometimes this could even create a contradictory obligations. Uh, and uh, the last one is the possibility of a trade diversion. So what are trade creation and trade diversion? Now let's look at them with two uh, examples. So first of all, the trade creation effect. This is the effect where the domestic production of a product is displaced by imports from an RTA partner when the good uh, is produced at a lower cost. So this sounds a bit dry, so let me illustrate this with an example. Let's say that uh, we are looking at this microwave oven. It could be manufactured in country A for $240. Country B for $220 and the rest of the world for $200. Uh, 
And let's say that country A has an MF and tariff on ovens of 30%. So uh, before um, country A entering into RTA with uh, any country, uh, the ones made in country A could be sold for $240. The ones made in country B would be sold for $220 plus uh, $66 of tariff would be $286. And then the rest reward would be $200 plus $60 tariff would be $260. So in this case, as you can see, there will be no impulse into country A. And then A and B form an RTA so that A would apply zero tariff to its impulse of ovens from B. So in such a case, we have a change scenario. So country A remained at $240. And then the ones from country B cannot be imported for uh, $220, and the rest were still $260. So the result of this would be A would start importing from country B. So here, as you can see, there is a net gain for the consumer in the sense that the consumer would gain uh, $20, have to spend $20 less, and this is what we call a trade creation effect. Before the formation of RTE, there was no trade, and trade was created because the RTE lowered the tariff and made it more conducive for the countries to trade with each other. The next effect is the so-called trade diversion effect. This is the effect where the imports from a lower cost country outside of RTE is displaced by imports from a higher cost RTA partner. Again, let's use an example. So let's say that uh, for this laptop, there's no domestic production in country A, and then the ones made in country B would be sold for $4,000, and the ones made in the rest world would be $3,000. So uh, A has a tariff on computers of 40%, so before the RTA came into place, if the import from B it would be $5,600. If the import from the rest of the world, it would be $4,200. So the result is that A would import from the rest of the world. But then the former RT and A apply zero tariff on imports of computers from country B. So in this case, they will stop importing from uh, country uh, from the rest of the world. Instead, they would be importing from country B because country B now is cheaper, at 4000 no need to pay the tariff. But this would result in a net loss of $1,000, because even though consumers pay $200 less, now they also lose a revenue of $1,200, so the net loss is $1,000, and this is the trade diversion effect. Uh, this is the effect that needs to be uh, uh, avoided. So, as you can see uh, from these uh, two examples, RTAs are very likely to hurt the excluded countries because they cannot enjoy the benefit under the RTA. And they could uh, potentially benefit the multilateral trading system like the WTO by further trade liberalization at the regional level uh, and also provide a laboratory for expanded or new trade policies disciplines and developing members' negotiating skills. But they could also damage the multilateral trading system by diminishing the attention to the multilateral trading system because of the diversion of resources and also creation of vested interest groups resistant to MF and liberalization and also uh, the failure to tackle the top issues in RTAs may result in entrenched resistance to tackle these issues at the multilateral level. And sometimes they could also diminish the transparency and probability and also the relevance of MFN trade. So if you look at the empirical data, uh, there's no strong evidence that RT will be trade creating, uh, but uh, sometimes the RT's trade diversion effect could be very strong. So this reminds us that we need to be careful in designing RTs. Now let's move on to the legal rules on RTAs. So the main legal rules on RTAs would include Article uh, 24 of the GATT, the Enabling Clause, and a Standing Up GATT Article 24, and also GATT Article 5. So the main article is the GATT Article uh, 24. So basically, the GATT Article 24 include both internal requirement and external requirement. The main internal requirement is paragraph 8, 
which states that you have to uh, remove duties and other restrictive regulations of commerce on substantially all the trade between the constituent territories. So what do we mean by substantially all the trade? Well, um, the WTO um, um, panel and the petty body had a chance to look at this issue in the Turkey textile case, and in the end, they said that um, substantially all the trade is not the same as all the trade, and it is something, but it's something considerable more than merely some of the trade. So what they are saying is that it is not all the trade, it is not substantial trade, it is the substantially all the trade. As you can see, not very, um, uh, um, not very uh, enlightening. So um, in practice, uh, there are uh, some questions remaining to be answered. That is, uh, whether or not substantially all the trade is a qualitative analysis. In other words, can you exclude a major sector like agriculture? Uh, and some people think the answer is no. So if you exclude the agriculture tax sector, you cannot say it is a substantial or the trade. But some people are saying, no, we shouldn't look at it as a qualitative analysis, but more as a quantitative analysis. That is, we should look at the numerical coverage of trade. So here the uh, consensus seems to be, there need to be at least 90% of a coverage of a trade. But uh, what do we mean by the trade that is covered? Do we look at tariff lines? Do we look at actual trade or potential trade that could be generated? Or do we look at the aggregated trade of uh, all the members of the RTA or just the individual trade of uh, RTA members? Another uh, interesting issue is what do we mean by other restrictive res regulations of commerce? So um, you know, for, for this, the WTO Article 24 actually does not provide us with a complete list. It only refers to uh, the um, uh, provisions other than those permitted under Articles 11 on quota, uh, Article uh, 12 on balance of payment, Article 13 on quota again, uh, and Article 20 on general exception and so on. But it doesn't list the other exceptions, such as Article 19 on safeguards. So does that mean that uh, you uh, have to remove all safeguards when you enter into an RTA? The answer is not necessarily so, because in the Argentina footwear case, uh, the panel looked at this issue, and in the end they decided that um, uh, you should have the so-called parallelism uh, requirement, which means that if you... Uh, decide to exclude the um, imports from your RT partners in the calculation of the total imports for safeguard measure, then in the final safeguard measure, you should also exclude all these uh, uh, countries' imports. Uh, but if you include them, uh, you cannot add, later exclude them from the, uh, from the uh, imposition. So this means that if you do not include these, um, uh, these um, uh, uh, imports, you cannot add them later on. So this is what we mean by the parallelism requirement. Basically, this is to prevent the situation where you include the imports from these uh, uh, countries in order to look at the effect, but in the final safeguard measure, you do not apply this uh, uh, safeguard measure to these FTA partner countries. In addition to the internal requirement, there are also external requirements and different external requirements depending on whether you have a free trade agreement or customs union. So for free trade ag agreement and customs union, uh, in general, the uh, duties and other regulations of commerce after the formation of the agreement should not be higher or more restrictive than before. So this is common to both. But then for customers union, there's an additional requirement that uh, you should apply substantially the same duties and other restrictive regulation of commerce uh, before, uh, uh, as before the formation of the customers union. So um, this is basically to make sure that uh, the formation of the customers union would not make uh, the um, uh, uh, conditions of trade more restrictive for other uh, WTO uh, members. And note here that uh, when we look at the restrictiveness of the measure, uh, and also when we look at whether or not they are substantially the same as before, 
we would basically uh, look at um, uh, the overall uh, effect, okay, uh, rather than uh, uh, requiring that uh, they should all be the same. Now, uh, finally, uh, let's turn to the rise of uh, CPAS. So, as I mentioned earlier, the rise of uh, RTAs, including CPAS, is a phenomenon that we have observed since the formation of the WTO, but it became uh, more and more uh, prominent since the um, collapse of the Doha round in 2008. And nowadays, if you look around the world, you can see that all the major players, the US, EU, China, uh, Australia, uh, and so on, they are all uh, frequent participants in uh, regional trade agreements. So if you look at the evolution of regional trade agreements, you can see several interesting phenomena. First of all, more and more RTAs are becoming from the truly regional ones to cross-regional ones. So previously, so if you look at some of the early RTAs, like the EU, like the NAFTA, like the ASEAN Free Trade Agreement, they are all regional, truly regional ones. That is, the, their members are all from the same region, and they do not involve members from outside of the region. But in recent years, uh, especially since the last decade, we saw the rise of so-called cross-regional RTAs. Uh, a good example is the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, or the TPP, which involves actually several major regions. Uh, East Asia region, Southeast Asia region, North America, Latin America, and Oceania region, rather than just limited to one region. So this means that uh, nowadays, uh, uh, countries around the world uh, see more and more the need to have uh, 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 connections with countries which are beyond their immediate neighborhood because uh, that is the reality of a trade. You see that many countries, their main trade partner is not necessarily the, the neighbors in the region. It could be a country that is far away uh, because they would have a more complementarity. Another interesting feature in the evolution of our RTAs is where we uh, have seen that the traditional RTAs tend to cover mostly trading goods issues, but the new generation of our RTAs will now cover new issues such as trading services and intellectual property rights. All these new issues, which were only added to the WTO when the WTO came into being in 1995, but not before. And similarly to this trend, we also saw uh, the focus shifting from traditional border measures, that is tariff and quota type of uh, trade restrictions, to domestic regulatory issues. Uh, that would be, uh, for example, the uh, domestic disciplines, let's see, on investment, on competition, uh, and so on. And this also means that uh, the issues have uh, 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 expanded beyond the traditional WTO issues, that is, the issues that are covered by the traditional WTO agreements, that is, uh, uh, goods, services, IP rights, to uh, WTO plus issues and WTO X issues. So, uh, uh, WTO plus issues are those uh, which add on uh, to the existing disciplines. So, for example, for services that is already covered, so these FTS also cover services, but they go deeper than WTO agreements. And WTO X issues are the issues which the WTO did not cover, but this agreement would cover, for example, like competition and other issues. And also, the RTs also expand from developed countries to developed countries and LDCs. Traditionally, developing countries are reluctant to expand uh, their uh, uh, trade agreements, but now, uh, because everyone is signing up uh, uh, trade agreements like uh, FTAs, so many different countries saw the need to also intend to FTAs uh, uh, for the fear of uh, preference erosion, because otherwise the MFN tariff they get from the WTO would not be sufficient, and uh, this is true of the traditional FTAs, this is also true of the new generation of FTAs, such as CEPAS. 
So what are the WTO plus and WTO X issues are we talking about? For example, uh, if you look at the, the list here for the WTO plus issues, you would have the uh, coverage on issues such as industrial goods, agricultural goods, customs administration, export tax, SPS measures, uh, state trading enterprises, TBT measures, countervailing measures, subsidy countervailing measures, and the dumping and safeguards, uh, right? Uh, and uh, also public procurement, uh, trade related investment measures, and also services and intellectual property rights. All of these were covered by the WTO already, but as I mentioned earlier, the RTAs would further enhance the disciplines on these rules. The WTO X areas are easy which were not even covered by the WTO agreements, but some RTAs have uh, made the step of uh, including them. Uh, because they think that these issues are important. So these include a host of new issues like anti-corruption, competition policy, environmental laws, uh, uh, labor market regulation, uh, uh, consumer protection, data protection, uh, the audiovisual sector, uh, innovation policies, culture cooperation, uh, energy, um, human rights, uh, health, uh, immigration, um, uh, the information society, money laundry, um, SMEs, uh, technology, uh, taxation, terrorism, and other issues. So all these issues were not even in the WTO agreements, but sometimes some countries, especially the major developed countries like the US and EU, has been uh, very keen to uh, expand the scope to include them. So we can see from this chart uh, that uh, WTO plus provisions and WTO X provisions have all become more and more popular uh, over the years. The difference is that, um, uh, interestingly, if you look at the WTO plus obligations, they tend to be more enforceable. That means that uh, the obligations are typically included as banning obligations in the WTO agreements. While uh, for the WTO X obligations, because they are new, because they are more controversial, therefore, uh, for most of CEPAs, uh, actually, even though they are included, but they are included more as best endeavor provisions. That is, the parties will uh, uh, try uh, their best effort at uh, enforcing these obligations, but um, if they do not enforce these obligations, uh, then um, you cannot drag them before dispute settlement. So that is the main difference between WTO plus and WTO X provisions. The WTO plus obligations typically are more enforceable. So the rise of all these new issues is reflected in, for example, the US sponsored FTAs like the CPTPP. So if you look at the CPTPP, it includes 30 chapters, and many chapters are devoted to the WTO plus obligations like investment and IP, and some chapters also include WTO X obligations, issues such as e-commerce, such as uh, uh, SOEs, uh, competition, uh, environment, labor, all these are provisions which are not really addressed by the WTO agreements, but now they are, are becoming more and more popular. And this is true also even for uh, the RTAs or the CEPAs, which are composed of mainly developing countries like the RCEP. So if you look at the RCEP, um, for the RCEP, when it first started, actually many potential members were reluctant to engage in new issues. Uh, but as you can see, the final agreement, which was concluded late last year, include all these new issues like investment, intellectual property, uh, electronic commerce, competition, uh, small and medium uh, enterprises, uh, government procurement, and so on. So this means that even for many developing countries, they started to embrace all these new issues in the CEPAs. But, of course, the inclusion of these issues raise uh, many challenges for developed countries when they negotiate CEPAs. First of all, there are simply too many issues. 
And this means that they go beyond the scope of traditional trade or commerce ministries. So uh, if you work in the trade or commerce ministry, you will know that your main mandate has been to deal with the tariff uh, reduction issue, okay, uh, or to uh, dismantle the trade barriers. But typically, it does not extend to issues such as uh, competition policy, such as uh, uh, the uh, IP uh, uh, rights protection, uh, such as uh, the uh, promotion of small and medium enterprises, and so on. So all these issues were traditionally handled by other ministries. So this raised the necessity for the trade and commerce ministry to coordinate their trade policy with different ministries and sometimes even with different stakeholders. For example, if you talk about new issues such as environment and labor, you have to deal with um, civil society groups like the labor union uh, and uh, NGOs like uh, all these environmental protection and non-governmental organizations. And uh, that uh, uh, also raised the level of uh, difficulty for the trade ministry to engage with different stakeholders. So this is a whole different game. So also you need a new negotiating approach. So uh, because all these new issues are included uh, and sometimes, uh, you know, for some of the, uh, 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 for some of the areas like investment, like services, the U.S. actually has pioneered with the adoption of a new negotiating approach like a negative listing approach. Basically, the idea is that uh, uh, the assumption is that uh, you would liberalize all sectors and you can only retain the restrictions that you have for a specific sector if you clearly spell it out. So this is very different than the traditional approach. The traditional approach, the positive listing approach, uh, as we will discuss in more detail for the module on services, is that you only liberalize the ones which you have put in your schedule. So here, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, negotiating approach has flipped. So basically means that uh, whatever you don't put in your negotiating uh, schedule as restrictions, then you have to liberalize this. So this means that as a regulator, you really have to understand the status quo. Uh, of regulation in your country for a given sector because if you don't understand that then you would forget to put such restriction in the uh, final negotiation schedule then in the end you have to liberalize that even though that might not be uh, your original intention so this also raises the level of difficulty and this means that uh, for the trade ministry people they really need to understand the regulatory environment in many different uh, sectors. And also, uh, with the inclusion of uh, all these new issues, there's also the additional need for uh, more regulatory capacity building, and that is why we are having this course today. Um, and uh, hopefully, through uh, this course, you uh, will have a, a better understanding of all these issues to be uh, discussed uh, by the um, uh, new uh, CEPAs and uh, you would be able to uh, help your country to understand these issues, uh, to better formulate your position on these issues and to negotiate uh, better agreements. So that concludes our first uh, uh, session. Thank you so much.